Hi everyone, welcome to my talk, Walking Your Dog in Multiple Forests, Breaking AD Trust Boundaries Through Kerberos Vulnerabilities. My name is Dirk Jamolma, and today we'll be talking about some uh, interesting Kerberos stuff. First a bit about me, I'm Dirk Jan, I live in the Netherlands, I do a combination of hacking, red teaming and researching at Fox IT, and I also like to write tools, usually focused on Active Directory or Azure AD, and I write about those on my blog, uh, or tweet about it on my Twitter account. So if you're interested, uh, definitely do, do check that out. What we'll be talking about today is uh, Kerberos and especially focused on forest trusts. So we start with a quick overview of how Kerberos works across domains. Then we move to forest and domain trusts, what they mean and what they do. Looking at trust transitivity and what exactly transitivity is. Breaking forest trust is the conclusion where we um, get diving into the technical details of the whole attack path that, uh, that I developed. So let's have a simple reminder of the Kerberos terminology. Uh, the most important thing is that Kerberos is all about tickets. So the first is a TGT or a ticket granting ticket, which is given by the domain controller to an authenticated user. Uh, they prove that they are um, the user by sending a, along their, their password. And then the DC gives back a ticket granting ticket that they can use to request other Kerberos tickets. Um, one such ticket that they can request is a service ticket. And a service ticket can be used to authenticate against services that accept Kerberos authentication, for example, file servers or web servers. An important component of the TGT and also of the service ticket is the Privilege Attribute Certificate, or PAC. Um, this is a, a, a piece of data that basically describes all the rights and um, groups that the user is in. So it, it, it contains a lot of security identifiers. Um, which are basically the unique IDs within a given domain of uh, groups and users. And um, these tell the server that you're authenticating to uh, which groups you're in without it having to query the domain controller separately. And we'll be seeing a lot uh, of these security identifiers throughout this talk, so keep them in mind. And there's an example of how a security identifier looks on the bottom of the slide. Some really important uh, points about Kerberos. Kerberos is decentralized. So the DC doesn't keep track of all the TGTs that it uh, gave to people. Um, but the tickets themselves are proof that um, it is a legitimate ticket by, uh, by being encrypted with the passwords that only the domain controller knows. So the trust in Kerberos is based on cryptography. And we'll see how that works by this. Um, before we dive into it, I just want to do a quick show of how the, um, the Kerberos authentication work. So if we look at um, a common example, the client that wants to authenticate to a server. First, the client will uh, talk to the DC when it logs in and it will say, hey, I'm a client, um, give, please give me a ticket granting ticket. And then it proves that it's actually who it says it is by uh, encrypting the request with the password. So then the DC knows that the client is who it says it is and it gives the client a ticket granting ticket. And then later on, the client can uh, the client can send this TGT back to the server and actually request a service ticket. And the service ticket they can use to log in on the server. And the DC knows that the TGT is legitimate because it's encrypted with the password of the KB TGT account. This is only known by the domain controllers, and that's how it knows that the ticket is legitimate because it's encrypted with something that only the domain controller is supposed to know. So the domain controller then gives back a service ticket or ST. And this service ticket is no longer encrypted with the, um, the password of the KBTG account, but it's now encrypted with the password of the service account. So the service account in this case um, can be the account that's used, uh, that's the computer account on the server. And if we send this service ticket to the server, the server can trust that it's valid because it's encrypted with its own password. So only that server can decrypt it, and by being able to decrypt it, it's kind of proven that um, the server, um, that the user got the ticket from the legitimate domain controller, because only the domain controller is supposed to know the password of the account on the server. Um, some important points that I just mentioned. Uh, the, the domain controller trusts the TGT because it's encrypted with its password, and the server's trusty service ticket because it's encrypted with its own password. Now, most times I said, um, in most cases, only the DC will know the passwords, 
Um, there are some common attacks and backdoors that, that abuse this. So if your AD is compromised, an uh, attacker can dump the password and then create their own tickets. These are called golden tickets. And you can basically create a ticket that contains any information that you want. If you compromise the service password, you can create silver tickets, which are quite similar, but in this case, they're encrypted with the password of the service that you're authenticating. So these are called silver tickets. Now, what we're talking about today is trusts and especially forest trusts. A forest trust is different from a domain trust. On the left, we see a forest with two domains, uh, forest A and a subdomain. And in, in this forest, the domains trust each other, but all domains are equal. And if you compromise one domain, you can basically um, use the legitimate functionality to uh, compromise the whole forest. Uh, forest, on the other hand, is supposed to uh, be a security boundary and uh, you're not supposed to be able to go from forest A to forest B in, uh, by default. However, the trust is usually set up to allow people to authenticate from forest A into forest B. So if someone is actually given permissions in forest B, then, um, well, that's, that's intended. So it's not a vulnerability. Let's have a look at how Kerberos authentication looks across trusts. So in this case, we have two parts. We have forest A and forest B. And once again, we are a client in forest A, but we want to reach um, the server in forest B. What client A will do is we'll simply ask the domain controller, hey, I want to authenticate in forest B on server B. And uh, the client doesn't know that it's in a different forest, but basically it's asked the domain controller and the domain and it sends a TGT along. The domain controller will then send a special TGT, which is a TGT that is that belongs to forest A, but is in fact signed with a trust key that is part of forest B. So when there's a forest trust setup, uh, a trust key is exchanged and both sides have this key in possession and they can exchange Kerberos tickets and they know it's a legitimate ticket because it's signed by the trust key. So the client can use this um, inter-realm TGT as we call it to request a service ticket in forest B. And the DC in forest B will then check the ticket and it will send back a service ticket, which the client can use to authenticate to server B. Now there is one additional point. I wrote a small filter here because um, there is a part called SID filtering. And what it means is that you cannot simply um, put anything in the ticket um, when you exchange it in a different forest. Because what we said before is that we assume there is a boundary between these forests and you're not supposed to simply, um, if you compromise forest A, you're not supposed to simply create your TGT, which can say that you have, for example, a high role a domain admin in forest B. So forest B actually checks the ticket that's sent along and it filters out all the security identifiers that it doesn't know about. So in most cases you can pretend any you are any user in forest A, but you can't pretend that you're a user in forest B using the inter-realm ticket. Before we continue, I just want to so, uh, quickly highlight some previous work. Uh, Will and Lee did some really nice work on breaking forest trust uh, last year. Uh, this was built on Kerberos delegation. Uh, that's very technical and we won't have time to go into it. But if you're interested in this, uh, definitely read out their blog on the link below. Uh, this was fixed in 2019. So um, once after it was fixed, uh, it was no longer possible to break forest trust, which is why I decided to research a, a new way. Now, before we start, we have to go with some assumptions. So we assume that we have compromised forest A some way and that anything in forest A is under our control. So anything that's um, on the domain controller, on the server, or anything that's exchanged between forest A and B, that's something we can influence. And we also um, assume that anything that is actually transferred can be modified. We also don't assume any non-default configuration or custom setup that's made by the organization, uh, because if permissions are explicitly granted, that's obviously not a vulnerability. So this leaves some questions. What information is actually exchanged between the two forests 
And can we modify this information in a way that gains us an advantage? To start us off, we need to look at trust transitivity. And some people wonder like, if there is a tree forest, and uh, both forest A and forest B trust each other, and forest B and forest 3 trust each other, does that mean that forest A implicitly trusts forest C? Well, short answer, no, that's not true. So for forest transitive trusts, uh, which is a trust between two forests, both forests actually keep a list of domains and security identifiers that are present in the other forests. And only the security identifiers that are on that specific list will pass the SID filtering. So if so, forest A doesn't have any trust with forest C, and it doesn't even know it exists. So if a ticket would somehow arrive uh, from forest C, uh, it would contain a lot of security identifiers that are in forest C, and forest A would be like, no, you're not on the list. I, I don't know what forest C is. So it would completely drop the ticket. So even though trusts are called transitive, it doesn't just mean that um, you can hop over trusts without doing anything. Now we, let's have a look at how these trusts um, work and how the data is stored and how the list of, um, of trusted domains is kept. So if we look in the, uh, in the Active Directory users and computers, there is a uh, object which is a trusted domain object uh, and it has the name of forest A. So this object has a property called the MSGS Trust Forest Trust Info, uh, which is a binary property containing um, containing data on the on the trust. We can decode this data, uh, it's documented. So I wrote a small Python script which uses the structures from MSADTS. And basically you see that in this record it contains two pieces of data. Uh, first is the forest a.kbthd.cloud um, root domain, which has a security identifier. And it also has the subdomain, which has a different security identifier. So both these domains are stored in the forest trust info and any other domains or other security identifiers won't pass through the SID filter. So this means, looking back at this picture, that we can go from forest A to forest B, but we can only um, put SIDs in our ticket that are trusted by forest B and that are on the list. Now I wondered, suppose a new subdomain is added in forest A. Does forest B automatically learn that this new uh, subdomain exists? Will it automatically trust it? And how is it even communicated? How will Forest B find out that a new domain is added? So I put it to the test and just set up some monitoring and logging uh, and, and Wireshark to see if there was any network traffic. And I added a new subdomain to Forest A. And as it turns out, uh, the domain controller of Forest B queries the domain controller of Forest A about every 24 hours. Uh, it uses the net logon protocol and uses the net r get forest trust information operation. Um, which it can use to get a list of all the domains in the, uh, in the other forest. It then uses the trust account, which is the same trust account um, that, of which the password is used to sign the tickets. It uses that account to authenticate. The netlock on protocol has a specific property um, and you can say that you're authenticating with a trust account. Um, so, you, so it can know that it's actually the other forest authenticating. And if a new forest if a new subdomain is added in the forest, they are automatically added to the MSDS trust for trust info property of the trusted domain object. So a new domain will automatically get added to the list and users from that new domain can also log in uh, in forest B. I wanted to see how the net logon call works. So I um, wrote my own script that uses the net logon protocol. Uh, but, but to authenticate, I first had to dump the um, trust keys. So you can do that with Pimicats. You notice there are two trust keys, one for uh, the incoming trust and one for the outgoing trust, because it's a bidirectional trust. And we see that the cleared X passwords are the same. Uh, that's only because the trust is new. Um, after 30 days, both forests will, um, on their own, rotate these passwords and it will no longer be the same. So the MD4 or the AC4HMAC for Kerberos, uh, which is the well-known MT hash, is also the same because it's not salted. But the AES keys, they do contain a salt, so these are not identical for the incoming and outgoing trust, which is something you have to keep in mind when you're uh, forging your own trust tickets, that you use the right key. 
So using this trust um, ticket or this trust password, sorry, and um, actually using a tool gettrustinfo.py that is based on Impacket, um, I authenticated to the domain controller and looked up the um, the first trust info in the same way that the domain controller from Force B will do that. So you can see that um, it sends that, uh, that net logon uh, request and it will get using the password of the trust and it will get back a list with security identifiers. So in this case, we see that the um, security identifier for the subdomain ends uh, in its last block on 221. So now that we have this information, in theory, we could add new domain sits on the other side of the trust. So if we add a new uh, subdomain and we assume we control all information, we could use a custom security identifier and add that to the trust list. However, is it really useful? Because we cannot use any existing domain in ForestB because ForestB knows which domains are in its own domain and it will not accept new, uh, new security identifiers that are in its own domain or, any, or on any other trusted forest. So you can't use any security identifier that Force B is already aware of. So I really started digging into, into this and couldn't really find a way, um, except when I started digging into what is really a domain. And you can figure that out by asking a domain joint uh, computer or server, how many domains do you trust? And where you would expect it to say, I trust only one, uh, the AD, the Active Directory I'm joined to, it will tell you that it just trusts two domains, the Active Directory domain that is joined to, but also its local domain, which is stored in the, in the registry and in the SAM partition. And this local domain also has a domain SID and it has um, relative security identifiers. A well-known one is just the 500 account, which is the built-in administrator account. But you can also have other local users which will have their own security identifiers. But they all have the domain prefix of this local domain on that uh, server or computer. An Active Directory is not aware of all the security identifiers of each member computer. And I wondered how much does a computer really trust its domain? So if we send it a service ticket that is encrypted with its password, would it blindly accept that? And as an experiment, I created two service tickets. So I created a fake service ticket with the security identifiers of a user without any special privileges, which normally shouldn't be able to do much on that machine except authenticate. And I also created a service ticket where I included the local domain sit of this of the server uh, and the 500 account for the local administrator as an extra security identifier. So let's see what it does. First, we create um, a silver ticket. We can do this using uh, the impact ticketer.py. It's one of the examples that is included. And we just have to supply all the information. In this case, I use the AES key of the computer account uh, because this is just a test and I just wanted to see if the computer accepted it. So this user is not in any special groups and as expected, we get an access denied error because it can authenticate, but it doesn't have any rights on the server. Uh, it's just a normal domain user and we cannot do anything with it. So if we connect over SMB, we try to list the C, C drive, which is limited to admin only, uh, we get access denied as expected. Now we create a new silver ticket. And this time, the user is also only part of domain users, so it's not a special user, it's not a domain admin, but we add an extra security identifier to the fake ticket that we created. And this security identifier contains the local domain and the 500 um, user account. So it basically says that we are also um, the local administrator on that computer. And much to my surprise, this worked. So we can pretend that we are the local administrator user, on this computer, and we can actually use the uh, C drive. So the computer accepts that um, that we are the administrator user, even though Active Directory shouldn't be managing that administrator user, and it definitely shouldn't be ending up in Kerberos tickets. So Active Directory doesn't manage the local domains, but still, if you use if you include one security identifier from the local domain, then a computer will, for some reason, accept it. So this is clearly an issue because we, because Active Directory shouldn't be sending those along and the computer shouldn't 
blindly trust the service tickets, even if, if it contains a security identifier that's not from Active Directory. And we see that local admin access is granted when either you uh, pretend that a ticket is from the local domain, while the local domain doesn't have um, a domain controller, so it doesn't even use Kerberos. But you can also include it as an extra SID. So these are two different ways to um, get an admin access. Fun fact, this also works when the local admin account is disabled. So if you add as an extra security identifier, um, it will completely ignore that this account is disabled and just give you the access you want. So using this information, um, we can design a new forest trust attack. And for that, we'll just go back to the drawing board real quick. If it wants to work. Yes. So here we see the, um, the same picture we saw previously. I just drew out the subdomain a bit more clear. So we see on the left the forest A with the subdomain and on the right we see forest B. Now what if we pretend that there's a, um, a new subdomain, so it's in red, and this new subdomain has the same security identifier as a server in this forest. So forest B will automatically query this information every 24 hours and then actually it will get back the data that there's a new, uh, that there's a new domain having the, the security identifier of the server. Because Forest B is not aware of all the local domains and all the local security identifiers that are in, the, uh, in its own domain, it will accept this and it will um, add the security identifier of the server that is actually in Forest B, will add it to the list of security identifiers that accepted that is accepted from forest A. So there are a few missing pieces for this. Um, first we need to convert the theory of spoofing a domain into practice and figure out how that works. And of course we also need to somehow obtain the local SID of this uh, victim computer that we want to compromise because it's not something that you can guess and it, you, it's not something you can query from Active Directory because Active Directory doesn't actually know these local SIDs. So let's start with that. We can uh, obtain the local SIDs on all the Windows versions using Summer RPC, which is also how Bloodhound queries local groups in the domain. But for versions that are newer than uh, Windows 10, uh, 1607 or for Server 2019, this is actually not going to work. Uh, because you need admin access. And if you already have accent admin access, then um, what's the point of still doing the attack? But there's another API that we can use. So we can use this uh, function over RPC from MS LSAT, which is the um, lookup names function, which translates a security principle name to their SID form. So if we know the security principle name, uh, which is the host name of the computer, we can ask it to translate this to the security identifier. So this is great. I also wrote a small script uh, using Impacket again. Um, and using that, we can uh, use the user from Forest A and authenticate to the server from Forest B. That we can do that because there's a trust in place and we can query the um, local SID, which doesn't require any admin privileges. So now we know the local SID of this server that we want to compromise. Now we actually need to spoof a domain. There are multiple ways to do that. The first one would be to actually add a new subdomain to forest A. Uh, we would promote a member server and somehow we, needed to, we would need to make sure that the uh, security identifier that's generated for this new domain is the, security is the same as the security identifier that we want to attack. A second way would be to actually modify the forest structure via LDAP or via DC Shadow and add the required objects that, um, that would represent the subdomain. So we could kind of fool the uh, domain controller into thinking that it has more subdomains than it actually has. This is kind of hard. Uh, a way that's less invasive is to actually hook LSAS when the NetR get trust, forest trust information request is processed and actually add a block containing the data for an extra domain. But it is also not that easy. There turn out to be a lot of functions. 
So in the end, the option I went for is just to hook LSAS and, um, and intercept the NetArg at Forest Trust information call and replace the security identifier of an existing domain with the target security identifier. Now, of course, these are not actually easy methods. So it took me a lot of time to actually figure this out and there was quite some reversion involved as well. But now, log you to the process. First, you need to somehow debug LSAS, um, which is a tricky thing because if you crash it, then your PC basically reboots and you can start again. But once you finally got it working, um, you can place a, break, place a breakpoint on the NetArg at Forest Trust information call and basically just step through the functions that are called and see what happens under the hood. And at some point, um, I ended up in the function which actually builds the, the resulting data blocks of the um, RPC call. And at some point in that function, um, there, is, there is a function which calculates the length of the security identifier. Uh, this is a very uh, straightforward function to hook because it has just one argument, which is the security identifier. So we know for sure that um, at the moment that this function is called, that the, that the first argument um, will, will point to the security identifier of the forest. And because it's the first argument uh, in XSC4, that's stored as a pointer in the RCX register. And if we look at the heap, we see that the um, security identifier is stored there and it's pointed to by RCX. You, well, you have to believe me on this, that this is actually the security identifier. Now, what you can do is obviously um, attach a debugger to LSAS, wait for the calls to come in and then manually um, intercept it, replace the memory, but it's kind of tedious and you really have to get the timing right because at some point RPC will just time out and it will do nothing basically. So what I did is I automated the thing and I used Frida. So what I actually did was intercept the um, RTL linked SIT function, which is imported from NTDLL. And when this, once this function is called, I look if, it, if the return address of the function call is returning to the place in uh, LSADB, which is where the, um, the function that we were previously looking at returns. So if, it's, if this address matches, then I know it's called from uh, a place in, the, in, in LSAS where the uh, block is built, and we can just replace the SID that we're looking for with the SID that we want to replace. Let's see this in action. So remember that before we queried um, the net logon call and we saw that the, the SID of forest, the subforest was returned. Now we run Frida and we basically intercept the security identifier when it's queried. So if we run these, this tool again, we see that this time a completely different SID is returned, which also happens to be uh, the SID of the workstation that we want to attack. So now we can actually intercept that call and make sure that when forest B queries forest A, that this um, security identifier will be different. And now we have to wait 24 hours, um, or we can speed up the process a bit. Um, there's actually a way to force this to query. So if you go to the trust properties and then you uh, save the trust details, then it will, um, will perform the query as well and then it will also update it. Of course, it doesn't work in real life because this would require, require access to forest B, but to demonstrate it, it's, it's just to make it a bit easier. If we look at the forest trust info again, um, we see that now the security identifier is different from before. And we see that uh, sub.forest A certainly has the same security identifier that we queried from the workstation that we wanted to attack. So here you see the local SID from forest B server now matches the SID that forest B thinks that our subdomain has. Now here's where it gets a little more complicated. So now we're gonna create our own inter-realm uh, ticket granting tickets. Uh, what you do here is uh, that you create a TGT and you sign it with the trust key and you add the uh, extra security identifier um, of the local domain that we want to attack to the TGT. And this is inter-realm TGT, so uh, it's, it's originating from forest A and it will be sent to forest B. Now we use that to uh, ask for a service ticket in forest B. 
Um, we specify the target domain, we specify the um, originating domain. This is also a custom script that I um, changed a bit so I can see what's actually returned in the ticket and verify that it works. And we request access to the uh, SIFS SPN, which is used for SMB. So we request a, a service ticket to talk to uh, SMB on server, uh, server B. And if we decrypt the resulting service ticket, um, you see all these values from the SID, uh, from the from the pack, and you see that in extra SIDs, the the SID that we inserted, it passes. So for B considers it valid, and we have now an extra security identifier in our list, which um, which should allow us to log in on the server. So let's test this. We give the ticket to SMB client. We make it connect to the Forest B server, and we see that indeed we can request now the C drive as if we were an administrator. So now we successfully used only our access in Forest A to compromise the server in Forest B. Now this only works on a uh, on a domain uh, only works on member servers, not on domain controllers because these don't have a local domain. But still, there are probably plenty of high value servers. Um, in Forest B as well that we want to compromise. Now this is uh, using Impacket. Um, you can also do this using Mimikatz and Kakeo. Um, that also makes it easy to do the windows. So first using Mimikatz we create the golden ticket where we specify the same parameters as before, so the local security identifier and the uh, AES trust key. Then I start a new um, session using RunAS, uh, which is just a clean way to start a new session without any existing Kairos tickets in memory. And we start uh, Kakeo. And Kakeo contains um, a lot more Kerberos tools than that um, Mimikatz does. You can also use Rubius, which is a C sharp rewrite. But in this case, we're using Kakeo and we actually um, instruct it to request a service ticket in Forest B and to submit that in our session. So now we can list the ticket. And we see that um, that we have the ticket in memory. And even with a fake username, uh, we can actually list the C drive. So that means that we successfully reproduced the same thing here, and we are actually now an administrator on Forest B. Just a few notes about this attack. Um, so it can be used to compromise any non-domain controller in a trusting forest. It does work with the one-way trust, um, but you will need one account in the other trust to actually query the local uh, security identifier because you have to obtain that somehow. It doesn't work against the trust direction. So if you have a one-way trust which is outgoing, which means that you trust the other domain uh, and not the other way around, then you cannot perform this attack. I disclosed it to MSRC in October 2019 and because it was quite a complex uh, patch day, uh, we agreed on February 2020 as a patching date. And they released a patch in February on Patch Tuesday and assigned CVE 2020-0665, one away from 666, which would have been cool. So this is actually fixed. And if you patch your servers, um, then you don't have to worry about this attack anymore. Some general conclusions. Uh, even though a trust is um, sometimes or sometimes not recognized as a security boundary, a trust still implies that you trust the other side. So um, if the other side gets compromised, then something you trust gets compromised. And you cannot just assume that because it's trust that you cannot move over the trust. And what we see saw here is that uh, this does require some network access for, to the main controllers and to uh, servers. Um, and if you have good firewalling and network segmentation um, on top of your uh, trust and strict settings, that would prevent against this attack as well. And even though extended transitivity is not a thing, so we couldn't go from forest A to forest C directly, um, if you compromise one trust at a time, you can still hop over. So in this case, we could reproduce uh, this attack that we did against forest B. We could also extend that to forest C after compromising forest B. So if you have multiple trusts, then this chain of compromise can really get long. Some acknowledgements, um, of course, this research built forth on a lot of other people's work, uh, especially those who also like to dig into Kerberos technicalities and uh, those who like to work tools and tutorials. So thanks a lot to them as well. And to conclude, 
Um, I did upload my scripts on my GitHub. So if you want to reproduce this uh, yourself as well, you can look at the Forest Trust Tools repository. Uh, questions are welcome. You can ask, ask them here live in the comments or uh, via DM on Twitter later, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you for listening, and I hope you, uh, you learned something new and fun. Bye.